Ah, uh, Mesopotamia. The land of messy cookware. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm actually going to keep this. Uh, I'm not going to start a new video. Why? Evil. This is the third lecture for ancient history and medieval history in the week of Monday, November 2nd through Friday, November 6th. This is Tuesday, November 3rd, Election Day. And we are beginning our survey of pre-classical river valley civilizations. Why did our cultural ancestors and some perhaps our physical ancestors settle in river valleys? Were they stupid? Did they not comprehend that in a river valley they'd be flooded out every year? That river valleys are more humid than hot uplands and more buggy than uplands? Did they really enjoy mosquitoes more than we do? Or snakes? Some of which are poisonous? Or crocodiles? Or any other lovely swamp vermin that exists in the shores of rivers? Obviously, they are not stupid. They know it's going to flood. That's why they settled there. In the era before modern industrial chemical fertilizers, <clears throat> some of the best fertilizer in the world comes from river mud. The decomposing dead plants and animals that end up in rivers, after a while, make really good soil replenishers. And you need to replenish the soil when you are growing things systematically in agriculture. If you don't, the soil becomes weak and the plants become feeble and eventually they stop coming at all. So fertilization of the soil uh, is very important. And better than manure is river muck. So if you live in a floodplain, which they did, you farm in a floodplain, which they did, and if you have developed some form of calendar, which they did, you might have an idea that the river's going to flood during a certain season. And that flooding will make the rest of the year worth it. Because that flooding will bring all the muck up onto the shore, slosh, throughout the entire floodplain, depending upon how high the waters get. And then the waters will receive, leaving all of that gunky, stinky, gloriously fertile mess right on top of your fields, ready to fold into the earth and plow, and it revivifies the soil. It replenishes the soil. And that fecundity, which is fertileness, which these river valley civilizations were able to take advantage of because of the natural floodwaters is a big deal. Something I didn't mention in my notes was the development of calendars. I suppose I should talk about it now. A calendar is something, oh God, will you know this? Am I going really much farther than your current knowledge? A calendar is something that measures time. In particular, Months and years. Weeks. Well, let's, let's go through. Seconds are basically based on heartbeats, close to it. Minutes are groupings of seconds that are useful for determining near-term uh, future events. Hours, the same thing. Days, though, are a natural phenomenon. The sun... It is orbited by the Earth, which rotates once every 24 hours. Thus, we have days. Weeks are developed by cultures and religions. For example, the seven-day week, which we use, is based on Genesis, God creating the world for six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Hmm. Well, what about months? Ah, Months are also, like days, a natural phenomenon. Moons were months many moons ago. Months. Because you know that there is a cycle of the moon waxing, getting bigger and brighter and more full, and waning, getting smaller and less wide and less bright. The ultimate waning moon is a new moon, which is dark. The ultimate waxing moon is a full moon, which is light. 
They're basically three nights of both. And in between is the waxing moon getting bigger and the waning moon getting smaller. So some societies use a lunar calendar, which makes total sense, except that the lunar calendar does not match up with the solar year. So if you use the lunar calendar, you are going to end up having your seasons move all over the place. There won't be, you know, December weather or July weather. Uh, the weather will simply be catch as catch can because you're measuring time by the moon. So most societies, even though the lunar calendar is self-evident and easy, uh, because it's such a short cycle, you know, 30, 31 days, whatever, um, but most abandon it for the solar calendar. And the first people to employ the solar calendar are the Egyptians. But the solar calendar is difficult. In order to calculate solar time, you need to do astronomical observations, and you need to have math. <clears throat> this is why Egypt builds many of its megaliths. This is why the Mesopotamians build the ziggurat. This is why the Aztecs built their step pyramids. This is why Stonehenge is oriented the way it is, because these megaliths, all of them in some way or another, measure time. They are big calendars. Because solar time doesn't have a big, obvious, glomming moon in the sky to tell us. And figuring out when the end of a year happens and the beginning of another year happens, it changes every year. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. All these seasons do is whatever the heck they want every year. It's chaotical. There isn't order to it. Unless you really watch the heavens. And if you really watch the heavens, because the fixed stars, the apparently fixed stars in heaven, continue to wheel overhead, you can calculate midwinter's day, midsummer's day, which are both solstices, the winter solstice and the summer solstice, December or July 21st. And you can also calculate the equinoxes, the vernal equinox in the spring and the autumnal equinox in the fall. The days of equal day and night. But it takes time to develop the astronomical knowledge to know how to do this and to do the math. And so a class of priest astronomers end up becoming part of the rulership in ancient Mesopotamia and priest astronomers in Egypt and these other societies as well. The Druids of the Celtic peoples could do this because the secret of calendar is worth living for, dying for, or killing for. Because if you have the secret of calendar, you can predict when the floods will come and when they won't, when the rains will come and when they won't, when it will be cold and when it will be warm, and you'll be able to have something other than, yep, yeah, it's cold out, to tell you. You'll be able to predict. You'll be able to plan. Now, of course, the climate does its thing, and the weather always changes, and it's never the same year by year. But if you have the secret of calendar, you can still engage in purposeful, efficient, effective planting. So it is worth it to put all that time in and build all those giant stone things, the megaliths. Megalith, giant stone thing. Now, we're going to go to Mesopotamia, which is the land between two rivers, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. One other thing. I warn you. I did not include this in your notes. And that's what I have here. I should have, but I didn't. So what I'm going to try to do is attach photographs of my board to this week's assignments so you can use them to write down the notes. I may even send a Word document that has these notes in them. It was just an oversight that I didn't include them in my notepad. Kind of important. I should have. Okay. Mesopotamia. 
The land between two rivers, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. In other words, it's modern southeastern Turkey, western Iran, and <clears throat> parts of Kuwait, and Syria, centered on Iraq. Iraq and the environs <clears throat> around it are Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. And there are seven great ancient oriental monarchies that develop in this region. Unlike Egypt, there are real cultural differences between these seven monarchies that appear over several thousand years of time. So we're covering the region of Mesopotamia and these seven monarchies in isolation. Even though Egypt is a part of their history and India to an extent is a part of their history and the barbarians that come and go are part of their history and even later on the, the Minoans and the Mycenaean Greeks are part of their history and later the other Greeks. We're focusing on the region and the seven oriental monarchies that developed there. So, in Mesopotamia, the world's first civilization appears near the mouths of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and Euphrates rivers as they debouch into the Persian Gulf. This is Sumer, with cities like Ur and Uruk, uh, the first cities are set up, and these cities are independent city-states. Each city runs its own affairs and the farmland around. Sometimes the cities partner up with one another, sometimes the cities fight one another, sometimes they just trade with one another, but each city controls its own independent city-state. Sumer is the first civilization. It predates civilization in China, which is saying something, <clears throat> because China is, 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 is providentially or proverbially ancient. Sumer is older. 5,000 years, six, 7,000 years, there are signs of Sumer developing. Now, this is how primitive Sumer is, or Sumeria. The Sumerians develop, as their high-tech item, the wheel. Now, you may think, the wheel, big deal. Try living without wheels. Try figuring out how you're going to move things or do things without wheels. Wheels are a big deal. And Sumer is just inventing things that the world will need. It's the world's first civilization. So it makes total sense that one of the basic machines out there, the wheel, is invented by them. Sumer is also known for developing the earliest form of cuneiform writing. Cuneiform writing is one of the ancestors to our alphabet. It is wedge-shaped symbols, usually written by a stylus, which is like a cross between a pen and a knife that makes impressions on the clay. You press in. And um, it can also be made by, if you want to make more than one copy, you, you carve a, a cylinder uh, with cuneiform on it, and you wrap a tablet, what's going to be a tablet of clay around it, press it down, and then very carefully pull the clay off. It's got to be moist enough to hold together. And then you let it dry flat, and you've got a, a written tablet made of clay. Or you can press in using a stylus. It's a bunch of wedge-shaped symbols, but it is the basis for what will later become our phonetic alphabet. So, kind of a big deal. Now, ziggurats are also a product of the ancient Sumerians. Ziggurats are step pyramids. They are particularly tall. They've got a nice big platform on the top. And they are both temples and astronomical observatories. These ziggurats are uh, the place where the priest astrologers do their sightings at night to determine the calendar. It is also a symbol. You've got these rough mud huts in chaos, maybe with streets, maybe with just alleys, uh, you know, blorped around this beautiful massive ziggurat. The mud huts are for the people to live their lives, do their trading, 
sleep, eat, all that stuff. The ziggurat is for the gods and for eternity. And it shows you the priority of this society. Now, Sumer is in the southern region of Mesopotamia. And at first, because they're the first civilization, they're surrounded by nothing but barbarians. But after a while, that changes. To the north, a new people comes together and organizes themselves as an army and <clears throat> as a civilization. This is Akkad, the Akkadian civilization. And Akkad, in northern Mesopotamia, what's now uh, northern and central Iraq, has its designs on Sumer. So the Akkadians <clears throat> march south and conquer the Sumerians. The greatest king of Akkad is Sargon of Akkad, providentially a strong king who commands an army. <clears throat> now, one of the realities of Mesopotamia is that you have empire after empire conquering one another. You might ask yourself, why? And the answer is geography. Geography, remember, is the bones of history. So geography, uh, the geography of Iraq or of Mesopotamia, is you've got these wide, flat, open river valleys. And these wide, flat, open river valleys are fairly easy to conquer. You send an army in. The enemy may hide behind canals, they may build some low walls, but it's not, it's not like they can hide up in the mountains. It's not Greece, it's Mesopotamia. So whoever happens to have the most powerful army at a given moment can spread their power and conquer an empire. And this happens again and again. Seven big civilizations. So Akkad becomes the world's first empire when it conquers Sumer. What's an empire? It's good that you asked. I'll tell you. An empire is when one government controls more than one culture at the same time. It's when one government controls more than one culture at one time, at the same time. So the Akkadians have their own language, their own customs, their own folkways, their own laws, their own ways of doing things. The Sumerians have a different set of everything of that. Different language, different folkways, customs, and all that. But Akkad has conquered Sumer. So Akkad is ruling people who are culturally Akkadian and people who are culturally Sumerian. As such, Akkad is an empire. The United States was an empire when we ruled the Philippines from 1898-99 through 1945 during the period between the Spanish-American War and the, and the end of World War II. The Philippine Islands Archipelago was a colony of the United States of America. The Filipinos, though Christian, uh, have their own customs, their own sets of languages. It's actually a fairly heterodox population in the Philippines, north and south, very different. Southern Philippines are Muslim. Um, and when the United States ruled over them, as well as the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Samoa, other places, um, America, the United States, was an empire. One government ruling over several cultures at the one time. But, like all empires, uh, they rise, they prosper, they decay, they fall. That's the pattern of human civilization. They rise, they're vigorous, they're strong, they conquer, they have their zenith, their time of uh, peak power and, uh, and peak efficacy and peak culture, maybe, it's golden age, possibly, and then they decay, they rest on their laurels, they become lazy, they stop risking things in order to achieve things, and uh, their decadence uh, and decay brings about their decline and fall. Maybe they're conquered, maybe they just disintegrate into anarchy, it depends. The third great monarchy is Hammurabi's Babylon. Babylon, in central Iraq, near a narrow point between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, is the crossroads of the world at its time. It is the great city of the world of its time. No other cities except perhaps in Egypt or maybe, maybe in China at that time. Uh, could compare to Babylon. 
But because of its location, Babylon is the crossroads of the world. It is the great city, the great center of the world. The way New York City was 50 years ago. The way London was in the 1800s and maybe today. Um, the great city of the world. And we've already talked about Hammurabi's code. Now, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Very clear. What also should be clear is that Babylon has two phases of greatness. Hammurabi's Babylon is about 2,800, 3,000 years ago. It's, 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 it's a long time. No, 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 no. It's older than that. Of course it's older than that. Um, it's between three and 4,000 years ago. In other words, it's between 1,000 BC and 2,000 BC. Uh, the second phase of Babylonian history is called the Neo-Babylonians. We'll deal with them a little bit later. That's the Babylon of King Nebuchadnezzar. So one clear way of remembering this, if you can remember the big long names, is there's Hammurabi's Babylon <clears throat> that comes first, and then there's Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, or the Neo-Babylonians that come later, Neo for new. So in Hammurabi's Babylon, this city at the center of the world, at the crossroads of the world, builds a, a gate <clears throat> that lasts to this day. It's called the Ishtar Gate. And it is made of this beautiful blue covering stone with some orange figurines on it, and I, I intend to have a link in the description. Uh, the Ishtar Gate is one of the great uh, surviving relics of very ancient times. You also have something that you all read from when you did Chapter 1, which was the Gilgamesh Epic. The Gilgamesh Epic is the world's first story, an epic tale of the world being flooded and a hero... <clears throat> who goes on the first hero's journey, and he encounters the hairy wild man Enkidu, who becomes both his friend and, and a, some, a challenge to him. And so the Gilgamesh epic, the oldest story that's non-religious that we know of, it's the oldest story, and, and of course it has religious elements if you're Babylonian. But there is a connection between the Gilgamesh epic and the story of Noah in the Bible. Both of these stories involve a great deluge, a flood, that, uh, that basically inundates the world. Now, could it be that this great flood was just a particularly bad storm season when the flooding came to the Tigris and Euphrates, and the Tigris and Euphrates went beyond their normal floodplains? Or... Or could it have been a climate change that brought rain for months and months and months, or maybe even years? It's possible. There are climate effects that could have done that. There's a story <clears throat> that deals with the uh, arrival of the modern shores of the Black Sea. Okay, the Black Sea is north of what is today Turkey, south of what is today the Ukraine and Russia. Uh, it's east of Romania, and it's uh, west of Azerbaijan and Armenia. It's this sort of, you know, uh, triangular sea uh, on a map. Just look up the Black Sea. You know where it is. Hopefully you know where it is anyway. But in early times, the Black Sea did not have the shores it now does. <clears throat> its shores were lower. And there's indication that there were cities <clears throat> and settlements along that shore. But then something happened. Earthquake, massive flooding, we don't know. But suddenly, another source of water floods in. Suddenly, all at once. Now, this could have been the Mediterranean breaking through at Gallipoli and the Dardanelles and uh, where Constantinople is and starting to flood. Or it could have been a uh, saltwater sea, like something between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Uh, there, there, are, there are various speculations. But what is clear is that the Black Sea has a catastrophic flood that rises its level significantly. To this day, the Black Sea has two distinct levels of water. 
The top layer is uh, permeated by sunlight and has the normal life and livelihood and oxygenation that you would expect and sea creatures. But below a certain depth, it's basically dead. There's not much motion in the water. There's not much oxygen. There's not much life down there. It's as if the sea never mixed. The new flooded waters appear over the old waters. I'm not a natural historian. <clears throat> I'm just telling you what I know. And what I know is the Black Sea to this day has this weird two-layered um, uh, composition. And that that may be from the time when the Great Flood flooded the shores of the Black Sea. Could it have been that that flood occurred during a time of great rain? But the fact that some of the earliest tales speak of a great deluge, a great flood, um, indicates that something happened. Something that both the Babylonians knew about in terms of Gilgamesh and his story, and that the ancient Hebrews knew about in terms of Noah and his story. And remember, Abraham comes from Sumer. He comes from Sumeria, that region of Mesopotamia. So Sumer and Babylon, fairly close. They may have both had flooding. That's not the Black Sea. I just threw that in there as a possibility. Anyway, in Hammurabi's Babylon, you have uh, the Gilgamesh. Then the Hittites come. And the Hittites are the region's first iron-using empire. They're a fairly militaristic people, but understand, iron may to us seem sort of ugly and brittle, but compared to the copper and bronze weapons that people were using beforehand, iron is much stronger. So let's talk about the Middle Ages. We've talked about the Paleolithic era and the Neolithic era. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the Copper Age first. We don't know who and where first figured out how to make metal. Maybe there was a big fire one night and they surrounded the fire pit with rocks like they usually do. And they found some interesting looking rocks. The next morning, one of the tribesman wakes up oh drank too much last night oh we'll never do that again look at fire pit what's that down there at the bottom clang 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 you gotta see this come over here look at the let's dig this out let's see what it is and what it is is the bottom of the fire pit has something weird and hard in it that has form-fitted to the fire pit shape and then has a mixture of ashes and rocks and gunk, but parts of it are clanging metal, sort of coppery colored. The wise people would then try to figure out which rocks partially melted and which rocks didn't. And it's the rocks that partially mel melted into this new metal substance uh, that, the, that we should start finding. Now, the first metal that human beings uh, get comfortable working is copper. Whether that was the first metal to melt or not, I don't know. But copper melts at a fairly low point. Uh, it doesn't take huge amounts of heat to melt copper as compared to some of the other metals. And what you do is you cast copper tools and um, that means you make a mold, like say I want a copper knife or a copper axe head. So I'll make a mold. I'll make it out of clay or I'll make it out of wood or, or, or stone, uh, probably clay. Uh, and I will uh, make the shape of the axe head that I want and a nice place for the wood handle to fit in. And then I'll make sure that the top of my mold has a hole in it or parts somewhere I can get it in. Then, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pit or a pot or, or something, I heat the rocks from which the copper is going to be extracted. The heat gets to such a point that the metal alloy in the rocks melts out. I then get rid of the rocks and heat the copper further until it's, a semi, until it's basically liquid. I then very carefully 
pour the copper into the hole into the mold. When it's filled, I stop. If I have other molds like a knife or, or whatever, a spoon, uh, I, I, will, I will pour the copper there, maybe a hoe handle or a hoe head. Then I wait. And nature will do its job when the copper cools. It will harden into metal. Then when I'm ready, I either pry off, not so easy to do, or I shatter, uh, much more easy to do, but you got to make them again, uh, the mold around the copper axe handle. And I, I get all that uh, clay off, that, that, that ceramic off. And then I clean it, and I polish it, and I sharpen the axe head, and I attach the wooden handle. I've got a copper axe. It's better than a, a filed stone axe, which is Neolithic. It's better than a chipped stone axe, which is Paleolithic. It'll last longer. So now I've got a copper axe, maybe a copper knife, maybe a copper rake or hoe handle to, use, to be used for plowing. This is good stuff. But copper is not very strong, and it'll quickly lose its edge and wear out, and you got to keep sharpening it and maintaining it. And if you use copper as a weapon, it's going to... It's gonna, it's, it's, it could break. I mean, when you're casting metal, uh, there could be flaws in the metal. Uh, the metal could cool unevenly, and there could be a bubble inside that you don't know about until you're fighting for your life, and all of a sudden you slash somebody with a copper knife, and it goes slammed, shatter, and now you've got your hands rather than a knife, and you've got somebody else's knife in your gut, but you can't really use it because it's in your gut. So... The wise people, the, the crafters and the wizards, they continue to experiment. And one of the experiments involves mixing stuff, mixing and matching and seeing what happens. And somebody figured out that if you mix a certain proportion of tin with a certain proportion of copper, you get bronze. Bronze is the world's first alloy that we use. Bronze is harder than copper. And it's more durable than copper. You can make a good bronze spearhead. You can even make bronze body armor. It'll bend, but it'll also help. You can make a bronze sword. Eventually it'll bend or break, but it may work for a while. The, Pelopini, the uh, Trojan War was supposedly fought with, with bronze weapons. It's bronze Age, Bronze Age Greece. And this is going to foster trade. Because while copper is available in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Greece, in Mesopotamia, like I said, tin comes from the British Isles. So the ancient Phoenicians, uh, who are the world's great mariners, live in the area that's now Lebanon, the cities of Sidon and Tyre, north of what is today Israel. Um, they actually set sail in ships made of wood, and in some cases, grass. Woven together, grand ships, Tate's guns, to leave the Mediterranean and go out into the Atlantic Ocean to fill their ships with tin and hope that the storm doesn't get so bad that it drives your ship to the ground. The Phoenicians were good sailors. They could bring tin. So if you could get a hold of a good source of tin through the Phoenicians and you had a good copper mine locally, you could make and use bronze weapons and bronze tools. And a lot of the societies did that. Certainly Hammurabi's Babylon. But when the Hittites come, they have iron. Iron has a much higher melting point. Iron is much more dense. It's much heavier, and it's much stronger than bronze, which is much stronger than copper. When you work iron at this level of technology, you don't melt it. You can't. You work it and heat it until it's like a, a semi-solid putty. And then you beat on it with a hammer on an anvil. Ding, 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 ding. And you try to slowly shape that semi-solid putty into a blade shape or into a hoe shape or whatever it is you're making. A spear tip. And when you've beaten it into shape, you know a few things. First of all, the metal has been compacted by the process, which is very different from the casting process where you pour uh, liquid metal into a mold, which copper and bronze weapons had.
You're not going to have the same flaws in an iron weapon. If you have a good blacksmith, there are going to be no bubbles inside, and there shouldn't be many flaws in the, in, in the construction. The, the metal should be a fairly solid piece when you're done. You fight somebody with a copper or a bronze knife, and you got an iron knife or an iron short sword, uh, you, you may break their weapons in their hands. You may have their weapons bend around yours. You have an iron spear tip against somebody's copper or bronze armor, you're going to go right through them if you hit the right spot hard enough. Iron is that much stronger than copper or bronze. So the Hittites have an advantage, a military advantage, over uh, the... Uh, Babylonians and the others who they encountered. The Hittites encountered the Egyptians, too, when they venture north. The Hittites build a great empire. The Hittites are also not a Semitic people. They are from beyond. So um, the, the sort of racial affinity that Babylonians and Akkadians and uh, Sumerians and Hebrews uh, all have with one another, the Hittites are, are different people. They come from elsewhere. Eventually, the Hittites are overthrown by a Semitic people, oh, yeah, local boys, the Assyrian Empire. Now, the Assyrians make something new. The entire nation is part of the army. The army is the nation. The nation is the army. The Spartans take some Assyrian ideas as they develop their own, or they just happen to develop along independent but parallel lines. Assyrians are always under somebody's orders. They are never relaxed civilians. They conquer relaxed civilians. But they, their leadership, are warriors, and everyone is part of the military. The blacksmiths are soldiers, the carpenters are soldiers, Everyone is in, under military discipline. Now, the greatest of the Assyrian kings is named Ashurbanipal, and Ashurbanipal uh, 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 does great building at the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which is in northern Mesopotamia, and builds a great empire there. The Assyrians as a people still exist. They're a distinct subgroup of the Iraqis and the Syrians. The Assyrians, though, are not Syrians. They're, they're different. The Assyrians tend to be Nestorian Christians. Nestorian Christians are a variant of Christian that uh, was founded by some of the apostles coming east and leaving the Roman lands and entering, entering the lands to the east. Assyrian Christians still exist although they've come under intense persecution within the last five or ten years, under ISIS particularly, but even today, Assyrian Christians are being targeted for extermination by Islamists within Iraq and Syria. It's a horror show. Then we get to a period about 600 years before Christ, and the Babylonians are rising again the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the New Babylonian Empire. And this New Babylonian Empire's greatest king is King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, before Nebuchadnezzar's time, as Babylon is expanding, conquering the Assyrians, among others, uh, they conquer Jerusalem. They conquer the descendants of David and of Solomon, who have divided their lands into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. The Jews, being divided and weak, are easy prey for the, for the Babylonians. The Neo-Babylonians offer the Jews uh, what they offer every, one of, every other one of their conquered people, live in peace under us and worship Marduk. The Jews, because the central fact of their existence is their Abrahamic monotheism, their worship of Yahweh, their worship of the Lord God Almighty, exclusively and with no compromise, uh, say, no, you won the war, but you can't do, we can't do that. So the Babylonians of the Neo-Babylonian Empire scoop up the population of Jerusalem and its environs and ship it off to the city of Babylon, where for 70 or 80 years, the Jews are kept in the 
first diaspora, the first great separation of the Jews, also known as the Babylonian captivity. I told you about this in the background to 9-11, how the Jews were tortured, singled out for sort of humorous, evil uh, sadism by the Babylonians who like throw 50 of them in a pit and feed them nothing but bacon and see what happens. Um, will the Jews starve and maintain their kosher dietary laws, which says no pork, or will they eat the bacon or, or will they do something like go cannibal? I mean, which they're not going to do if they're, if they're going to do anything like that, they'll eat the bacon. Um, they do things like throw Daniel, the prophet into a, a, a labyrinth with lions and daring him to have his God let him live through the night. And uh, according to the Bible, Old Testament book of Daniel, Daniel lived through the night among a bunch of hungry, angry lions in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the great conquering king of Babylon. Daniel becomes an advisor of his. And he builds one of the great seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Hanging Gardens, imagine on a, a terrace of the palace, a great set of terraces. You plumb water and bring it up to a point on these terraces where you have plantings and planters and fruit trees and fragrant herbs and water fountains and it's like a uh, it's like heaven on earth. It's like what the Muslims will later picture picture as paradise. It is a beautiful secret garden for Nebuchadnezzar, one of Nebuchadnezzar's queens. Uh, he, he, he makes it as a gift to her. And uh, to this day, it is remembered with honor and awe as one of the great wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon, terraced gardens in the palace where they managed to bring enough water up to make this garden grow. In the midst of a city, in the midst of uh, a region of river valleys, and then desert, uh, these beautiful gardens with plants from all over, and even a few animals to inhabit. Finally, the seventh of the great seven Oriental monarchies is the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Most people just know it as the Persian Empire. This is, I call it Achaemenid because there's a later Persian Empire that comes in Roman times known as the Sassanids. The Achaemenids are the first Persian Empire. The Sassanids or Neo-Persians are the second Persian Empire. A bit like Hammurabi's Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Well, in the uh, early, well, the early 6th century uh, BC, about 70 or 80 years after the city of Jerusalem is conquered, Cyrus of Persia marches west. The Persians come from Iran. They are Aryans, Aryan, Iran, the Aryan the people. Uh, so Aryans, as a racial group, come from an area that is today northern India, Pakistan, the Indo-European language group is an Aryan language group. Uh, the Persians or Iranians are Aryans. Uh, some of the Swedes and uh, Norwegians and Germans are Aryans. It's, they spread out uh, a wide uh, people. But the Aryan or Iranian or Persians in particular uh, are seen somehow as the heart of one of their cultures. On the Iranian plateau, a culture of horsemen developed. And that culture of horsemen are the uh, Iranian armies, the Iranian soldiers. This culture of horsemen uh, ends up conquering the Iranian plateau and joining with the Medes, which is another empire that's been at work conquering. The Persians and Medes, Medes fuse, fuse under Persian rule. The great, first great king of Persia is known as Cyrus the Great of the Achaemenid house. And Cyrus conquers Babylon. He conquers not only the Iranian Peninsula, which is already his, he conquers the area of Eastern Turkey, which is controlled by the Medes and Central Turkey. And he conquers Iraq and parts of Syria and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia uh, in toto. And he conquers uh, also um, 
uh, Judea, Israel, and the the Levantine coast uh, of Lebanon, um, north of Syria, where the Phoenicians live. Cyrus conquers all of this in his lifetime. And he tells the Hebrews, the Jews, in their captivity in Babylon, you're free, go home, worship as you like. Just send me earth and water and pay your taxes and and uh, and uh, follow follow the few laws that I send you. And the Jews view Cyrus the Great as a, an agent of the Lord God Almighty. Cyrus himself was certainly not a Jew. He was not even a monotheist. But the idea is that God can work through all sorts of people. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be believers even. They just have to be people of destiny. And Cyrus of Persia, by freeing the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, is considered one of God's men of destiny, and he is considered blessed in memory by the Jewish people in the Old Testament. He's a hero figure, because he allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem and resume their worship, and uh, this is a, a wonderful thing. And the Persians and the Hebrews get along very well, because they don't mess with one another. As long as the Persians have the general obedience of people, they're okay. Now, the religion, uh, Cyrus's successors, Cambyses and then Darius from another house, um, conquered the entire eastern world, including Egypt, as well as Mesopotamia. Basically, everything from modern Libya, eastern Libya, Kyrenesia, Benghazi, that area, all the way to Persia, through Persia to the Indian border near Pakistan today in modern Pakistan is part of the Persian Empire. Persian Empire is huge. Cyrus, Cambyses, his son, and, and Darius, his, his, his great nephew, uh, they all, uh, they conquer this massive area. Now the faith that they follow is Zoroastrian, Persian dualism. Ahura Mazda or Urmaz, the Lord of Light, Araman or Angramayu, the Lord of Darkness, uh, the universe is created by their matter and antimatter explosion. We're inside that explosion. It's inherently unstable. And our choices, each and every one of our choices from each and every one of us, will ultimately not only determine whether our soul goes to heaven or hell, but whether the world itself goes to heaven, becomes it, or goes to hell, becomes it. That is where we will leave Mesopotamia. The next lecture and the last one this week, perhaps, is about ancient Egypt.